A teacher, coming home from a long weekend, found an entire human being shoved down in her toilet looking up at her. This led to wild speculation as to why and how this person even ended up in there. Today I want to talk about a cool new product I found when it comes to fragrance. This happened to be Scentbird's new sister company, and you've all seen that I love Scentbird and what they do. This one is called Drift. Drift creates air care products for your car and for your home. All of the materials they use are sustainable, and their scents are made with natural, essential, and fragrance oils. Their car products include stone freshener, wood freshener, and even a metal one. For your home, they've got candles, reeds, home sprays. Drift is truly a one-shop stop to make your home and car smell awesome. What's cool about the car fresheners is that you get them as a subscription. First, you'll get a starter kit with the clip and the scent. And then you can just get monthly refills as it's pretty good to change it out every 30 days. The best part is their scent of the month, which always features a new limited edition scent. They're inspired by the season and all of those good memories and emotions that come attached to it. This month I got the wood visor clip freshener. Due to a recent incident, my car now reeks of salmon and this was the perfect time to get something like this. It smells great, like freshly varnished wood. It's neither too powerful nor too weak, it's the perfect level of scent to enjoy driving. With scenting an environment, nose blindness becomes a real thing, where you get used to the smell of your place and can't really smell it anymore, so scent of the month also gives you some variety to enter into your nose every month. Their subscription style is very flexible, you can change your scent choice, your delivery frequency, or cancel your subscription anytime you like. Make sure to use my coupon code DIRE55 for 55% off Drift for your first month. Thanks to Drift for partnering with me on this video. Check out the link in the description below. The day is Friday, February 24th in 1989. The Showa Emperor of Japan has just passed away and a state funeral is being held. Due to this, many people across the country got a day off from their jobs. One of these people was an unnamed elementary school teacher that we will simply refer to as the teacher throughout this video. She lived in a very small cottage-style dormitory for teachers near her school out in the village of Miyakoji, a small settlement out near Fukushima. Getting this Friday off meant that she would have a much-needed three-day weekend, so she decided to go home to her parents and spend some time with them. She decided to take one further day off, being away from her dorm until the 27th. The next Tuesday, the 28th, she came back to her dorm and to her job and taught classes at her school all day as usual. At around 5 in the evening, she finally got around to heading back to her room. It had recently snowed outside and the wind chill was bone-chillingly cold, so she hurried back as quickly as she could. This run shook something loose in her and she realized that she really had to go to the bathroom. At this time, the building wasn't very well developed. The attached bathroom was hardly more than an outhouse, with nothing more than a squat toilet in the ground to serve as a bathroom for each room. Under the toilet was a simple U-shaped pipe that linked the toilet inside to a drainage pipe outside where someone would periodically come out, open the lid, and manually get rid of the sewage. When the teacher was getting ready to use the toilet, she noticed something strange down inside that caught her eye. It was a shoe, actually. An entire shoe inside the toilet. She decided to go outside and open up the lid to the exit of the pipe to see what was going on. This was when she discovered that an entire person was shoved down into the pipe. She started freaking out, understandably, and ran to get the attention of the principal and the other teachers. One of them called the police while the others came to gawk at the man shoved into the pipe. The police came out, but unfortunately there wasn't any life-saving to be done. This man was already dead, and he might have been for quite a while. Getting rid of the body alone was going to prove very difficult. The opening for the tube was extremely small, to the point where they had no idea how the man was even in there at all. The opening was only about 36 centimeters or 14 inches wide and the inside of the tube was even smaller, about 20 centimeters or 8 inches. The only way they could even get the body out was to completely destroy the toilet, remove the pipe, and break it open. But they had no choice. The body was in a crouched position with the head facing the toilet inside, looking up. The man was not wearing a shirt despite the frigid temperatures, but he was pressing his jacket up against his chest. The shoe that the teacher had originally spotted was actually placed on top of his face. The body was, as you might imagine, completely covered in crap at this point and had to be thoroughly washed a couple of times before an autopsy could even be done. When it was done, it was found that he didn't have any injuries aside from slight scrapes here and there on his elbows and knees. 
When it came to a cause of death, it seemed that hypothermia was the culprit. It was believed that he had been dead since February 26th, a full two days before the teacher came across his body. The body came to be identified as that of a local man who lived just barely 10 minutes away from the teacher's dormitory. His name was Naoyuki Sugano. Naoyuki was only 26 years old and had worked out at the Fukushima nuclear plant, with some reports saying that he worked in overseeing safety plans and others saying that he worked in sales. In contrast to the way he was found, he actually had a very good reputation. He was known for volunteering for activities related to the local youth association, he was the MC at several of the townspeople's weddings, and he even helped out in campaigns for local elections. The timeline of events proved to be confusing. Naoyuki had been missing since February 24th, four days before he was found. The last person who ever saw him was his father, who he lived with. Naoyuki came up to him at about 10 a.m. while he was watching TV in the living room. He told his dad that he would be back soon before leaving their home, saying that he was going to run some errands. His father has since said that Naoyuki was behaving as usual, the same as ever. From that point onwards, nobody ever saw or heard from Naoyuki ever again. Once night came around and his son still hadn't come home, his father started getting worried and called the police. Police, in their examination, quickly felt that a third party was not involved. From the way they saw it, Naoyuki must have gotten into the toilet of his own will from the outside pipe, hoping to get a good look at the teacher. Given Naoyuki's great reputation around town, the people who knew him weren't content with this explanation. They didn't like the implication that Naoyuki was some kind of pervert. This caused a lot of outrage throughout Miyakoji. The people, and even the police, still had a good number of questions in relation to the case. The most immediate question on everyone's mind was, of course, how and why did he end up in that toilet in the first place? At that point of time in Fukushima, the weather was still bitter cold. Nobody in their right mind would have gotten into a cold, underground pipe full of even colder liquid. The air outside was bad enough on its own, and there was still a good 8 inches of snow on the ground all around on the day Naoyuki went missing. Many people wondered why he would even be missing clothing when it was already so freezing cold outside, but that only actually furthers the most likely cause as being hypothermia. In a phenomenon known as paradoxal undressing, people will often feel extremely hot, even remove all of their clothes, and sometimes hallucinate. This very likely could have been the reason as to why exactly Naoyuki wasn't wearing a shirt or shoes. Others pointed out that if Naoyuki was really intending to peep at the teacher, he wouldn't have been able to see a thing in the first place. The lighting in the room was far too dim, especially with someone crouching over the only opening. Granted, he may not have known this before entering, but it seemed that anyone who was going to come up with such a gross plan would probably at least figure out the bare minimum logistics of the operation. Some others pointed out the sheer difficulty of entering such a small pipe. As stated before, that model only had a diameter of about 14 inches, one end outside of the building and one inside under the toilet. The toilet covered the majority of the indoor pipe, meaning he only could have entered through the outside septic tank. Naoyuki was listed as being 5 foot 7 inches tall. According to the data released by the Japanese Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry at the time, the average shoulder width for a man of his height and age would have been roughly 16 inches. This meant that, although it isn't completely impossible that he could have entered the pipe, it would have been very difficult, especially to maneuver around the bend once inside and get himself into the position he was in. Not to mention it would have been a claustrophobic nightmare. Naoyuki's own father later used the same kind of pipe to try and reenact the crime scene himself. He found that, at least for himself, he couldn't even get into the pipe with or without clothing. Being that he wasn't much different in size from his son, he felt that his son couldn't have even got in there on his own, especially with the minimal cuts and scrapes he was found with in the end. Not to mention, he knew his son and felt he would have been disgusted by the very thought of entering into a bunch of sewage. At this point, I'm going to address the elephant in the room as I know it's what you're all thinking. Maybe he had a fetish for this sort of thing. I mean, stuff was going to be coming down on his face in that position, and yeah, maybe he did. There isn't really any way to know, though, and nobody who knew him knew anything about it, at least. Which is understandable, I mean, that's not the kind of thing you're going to be telling everybody. Now Yuki being found without a shirt was one thing, but the situation on his feet was even more strange. One of his shoes was found placed on his face, but the other was actually missing until it was found later, out in a field near to where he parked his car. The car itself was another point of mystery. 
It was parked in a lot pretty near to the dormitory, but it was found with all of the doors unlocked and the key still sitting in the ignition. This led people to question as to whether Naoyuki even planned on getting out of his car for more than just a minute. Even being as safe of a country as Japan is, most people wouldn't brazenly walk off with their keys still in the ignition if they were going to leave side of the car. All of these revelations brought the hypothermia into question. It would have made sense for Naoyuki to start freezing and undressing while he was in the pipe, but the shoe being removed near the car shows that he was already starting to undress before even arriving at the pipe. If he was freezing at this point, why didn't he stay in the car with the heater on? The car was still in perfectly fine working condition, and he could have even just gone home if he wanted. People began to question the timeline as well. Nobody in the country didn't realize that the state funeral was going on and that a good number of workers, especially teachers, were going to have a long weekend. Even if Naoyuki somehow didn't know this, it was obvious that nobody was even staying in the dorm at the time. He knew that, bare minimum, the teachers wouldn't be back until the 27th, but he was already entering into the tank on the 24th, meaning he was going to lie down in there for days before he saw anything he might have wanted to see all without food or water and freezing to death in sewage. As small town gossip tends to go, there was no shortage of it as villagers tried to come up with their own theories as to what happened in this case. To this day, rumors and theories still pop up online here and there. One of the biggest rumors centers around the teacher who discovered Naoyuki in the first place. Many have said that, although she was engaged at the time, she was actually having an affair with Naoyuki. Others have said that they weren't having an affair, but instead that Naoyuki was friends with her fiancé instead, possibly pointing to some jealousy. While neither of these could be proven, it was widely known that Naoyuki was an acquaintance of the teacher at the least, given that they had been seen interacting in the past. If the two really were having an affair, or if he was some kind of stalker, that would have actually just made it even more likely that he would have known her schedule ahead of time and that she wouldn't even be there when he entered the toilet. Those close to the teacher pointed out that she had been receiving weird phone calls in the time leading up to Naoyuki's disappearance. Someone was, in true horror movie fashion, calling her up and breathing into the phone while making strange noises. She told her fiancé about this, and he helped her to record the calls. They then took the recordings to the police, who found them neither notable or concerning. Oddly enough, though, some have even said that Naoyuki himself assisted the two in recording the phone calls. No matter what the angle, many felt that the teacher was at least involved in the disappearance somehow. Many felt that she might have even been the murderer herself, even though the case wasn't believed to have even been a murder. Given as poorly lit as the bathroom was, many questioned how she would have even seen and made out the shoe down in the pipe in the first place. Others questioned that, instead of asking for help removing the shoe, why she went around to the outside and decided to look into the septic tank herself. It seemed to be an unnecessary, gross, and oddly brave move for her to pull. This led people to wonder if the claim that she found him in there was merely a way to frame the murder in her favor. As many theories about the teacher as there were, some theories actually pointed elsewhere. About 10 days before Naoyuki's death, there was a particularly heated election taking place for Village Chief. Naoyuki was asked to lobby for one of the candidates because of the level of respect he had within the community. Some felt that these events were oddly close together and wondered if Naoyuki might have stumbled upon something incriminating while working on the election, possibly bribes or sabotage of some sort. Naoyuki's workplace also came up as the subject of many theories. At the time, there were supporters of nuclear power in the area, but there were also many who opposed nuclear power in general. Supporters felt that it would be a great way to create both new jobs and energy, but others were concerned about the possible harmful effects to the environment. The new village chief was going to have some amount of power when it came to deciding whether or not the plant was going to get to remain. Believe it or not, this wasn't the only concerning thing to recently happen at his workplace. About a month before his death, there was an incident at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. A pump in Reactor 3 had malfunctioned, causing a bunch of contaminated metal fragments to leak out. After a while, Reactor 3 had to be shut down completely. Given that there were so many anti-nuclear protesters in Fukushima at the time, the nuclear power company feared backlash due to the incident and decided to cover it up and neglected to report it. As much as they tried, though, it came to light about a month later. When it did, Naoyuki was questioned about the incident. A short time after, his supervisor, the operation manager, jumped in front of a train at Tokyo's Ueno station. Many felt that it was too coincidental that one man took his life after this incident and another ended up dying in mysterious circumstances shortly afterward. 
Of course, there were some other, less widely believed theories as well. Some of these questioned as to whether or not Naoyuki entered the pipe of his own will, or if he had an accomplice of some sort, for some reason. In the end, none of the theories were really backed up with any sort of concrete evidence. All of it was pure speculation, and a lot of them even had very noticeable holes in their narratives. We can only really guess as to what actually went down that day. The case was closed, and the police never did reopen it. Due to the statute of limitations having passed, it's extremely unlikely that they ever will. The villagers knew Naoyuki well enough to feel that he wouldn't have been up to anything malicious, leading to more than half the townspeople, over 4,000 in total, to sign a petition requesting that the police continue the investigation. This was to no avail. To this day, nobody really knows what happened to Naoyuki. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like as it helps out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. It's been a while since I've done a Japanese case, so I was pretty happy to get right back into it. Uh, if you know of any others, feel free to recommend them in the comments. Feel free to follow me on social media if you want, and if you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon, which I keep linked down in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We have Ron Mario, Travis Billings, Lettuce, Lord Fool, Jim Dowell, Kimmy Leffel, Molina Lee Williams Haas, Motaz Hawk, M. Pilato, Stephen Jamie Kramer, Max Swordguy, L, Rain Noir, Pao Yang, April Diamond, Starfade, Astral, Grack, Angie, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Rensenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Main, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You are all too good to be stuck in toilets. Thanks again to Drift for partnering with me on this video. Don't forget to go to their website, drift.co, and use my coupon code DIRE55 for 55% off Drift for your first month. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.